Welcome to the Post Questionnaire. 35 questions giving us insight into what makes creative people tick. So I am really excited to talk today with Rowan Ricardo Phillips. It's fantastic to have a poet on our Proust podcast, and what a poet he is, too. Yeah, he's remarkable. So he's a, considered still a young poet, um, but he's also written um, a tennis memoir and a book of criticism. And he's a translator, too, right? Spanish, Catalan. That's right. That's right. And the book of poetry, his first book is called Heaven, um, or one of his books is called Heaven, and the most recent book called Living Weapon, which just came out, which has kind of very kind of granular, detailed, immersed daily experiences that then sort of enlarge to very large concerns. Yeah. Um, and I've actually uh, had uh, Rowan on another podcast and talked about uh, the poet Phyllis Wheatley, who was the first woman of African descent to publish a book in America in 1784. And we talked about the condition of being the first. Mm. And he said something really nice to me. He said, Uli, the canon, the tradition of literature, didn't anticipate people like us. Right. It didn't actually. It kept on trying to perpetuate itself. And people like us, meaning anybody who brings a new voice into these conversations. Right. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's not an easy balance, I think, to strike. Proust himself wrote a bit about this uh, during World War One about the position of artists um, relative to big political developments and social problems and how, as an artist, you engage with that in a way that doesn't just sound doctrinaire, that doesn't limit your creative vision, but also that acknowledges what's happening in the world. And I, I, one of the things I really enjoyed about this conversation with Rowan Ricardo Phillips was hearing the way that he takes on board these big issues of race and social, social justice and uh, the problems, the many problems facing the planet today. Uh, but his art is also in the service of kind of an even bigger, very um, humane vision. Right. And he's very committed to a poetry. Yeah. Actually, he's a, he's a very active um, reader, participant. I've seen him many times actually reading. And the one thing that was very moving, the late Harold Bloom, who passed away last fall, one of the great literary critics of sort of the generation above us, he sent Rick, uh, Rowan a letter and about a year and a half ago and said, I received your your copy of Heaven, and it gives me hope that there's a future for poetry in America. Hmm. Unsolicited, unprompted, Harold was not that well at that time. Coming from Harold Bloom. I, I mean, he must he, get thousands of books. Thousands of books at press. Unsolicited, him, yeah. He just sent a personal letter to Rowan and said, your poetry gives me hope. Which is, what What more can we expect? No, no, that gives me hope. I'm thrilled that we got to talk to him. And this is a really, uh, it's a, a thrilling conversation. Really great conversation. Rowan, hi. Welcome to the Post Questionnaire. Yes, thank you for joining us today. Right. Thanks for having me. Um, all right, I'll start, I suppose. Uh, first question, what is your idea of perfect happiness? Oh, my idea of perfect happiness is clarity. It's what I always wish for my, my, my friends and loved ones. Yeah. Clarity. The rest comes with it, whether it's happiness, sadness, love, isolation, solitude. People want different things, but I just want them to be clear. So for me, perfect happiness is clarity. That's wonderful. Nice. We, wow. Yeah, wow. we hear many variations, obviously, on the theme, but that's a new one, and yeah. that's fantastic. And does that clarity, would you say that applies also then to your work like when I first heard the word clarity I was thinking about clarity in language for oh instance. no Not, because that for me is about feeling I, I don't see. mind with my work um, I don't mind an absence of clarity but mm -hmm. I do want kind of a sense of um, the arc of a journey sure. I'm much more about the process and I trust the process yeah. but in terms of kind of like what it means and everything like that yeah. um, I don't I never find myself worrying too much about that yeah I mean we're kind of meaning machines, right? That's why we're here. So I'm much more interested in the process than the result. Sure. And you have clarity about your interest in the process. Right. Well, and, and I guess in that way it is the same. Because when I say clarity for, in terms of perfect happiness, it's about the process, not the result. People have different wishes for outcomes and everything like mm -hmm. that. I mean, I'm a poet, so I know people who love solitude. Right. So I don't then say to them, I, you know, I wish you were like surrounded by people all of the time. <laughs> yeah. But just kind of clarity. I think we're... Between social media and late like, capitalism and everything like that, we really live in a perfect situation to not know ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And I think actually that's the way those forces work. They want us to be 
um, estranged from ourselves. Yeah. And so for me, you know, mm-hmm. knowing myself and feeling that I'm around others who know themselves is mm-hmm. pure happiness for me. Wonderful. Whatever the outcome is, I'll live with it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, totally different vein. And we asked these questions in the order that they originally appeared in on, on Bruce's questionnaire. Uh, so this will feel like kind of a U-turn. What is your greatest fear? My greatest fear is not doing what I'm supposed to do. I think I'm supposed to write and make art, I think. I'm pretty sure. Um, and if I don't do that, then I'm wasting my time. So I guess my greatest fear would just be not doing what? My intuitive organs and um, what kind of like all the circumstances of my life really told me that I'm supposed to be doing, which for me is writing, you know? What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? I will speak first and listen second. Sometimes. But when I do that, I don't like it. What is the trait you most deplore in others? That they speak first and listen second. <laughs> Uh, which living person do you most admire, if there is such a person? That I most admire? Mm. Um, well, my mother. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my mother. Mm-hmm. What is your greatest extravagance? That I take my time. I channel my inner Maxine Waters and I reclaim my time every, <laughs> every moment that I can. Time. Yeah. I, I, I will really reset and take time for myself if I feel that I need it in any circumstance. I will just that smoke balls sound, like a ninja. That does sound yeah. extravagant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's right. It, it, it is fun. Clarity I, there I, too. I need it. I'm not a big sleeper. I get maybe four or five hours of sleep, yeah. but I, I do need time. Yeah, I guess that ties into clarity, maybe. Yeah. But I, I need time for myself, and yeah. I take it. Yeah, and as you were saying, also, kind of the forces of late capitalism and social media, that alienation that those sort of feed also leaves us with less time. Right, right? because even though you think you're taking time yourself, and you're on uh, social media and the internet, and you're getting all types of targeted advertisements and the such right. like that, it's oh, not sure. time for yourself. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm very much... Um, you know, the strange thing, you know, you're from Berlin, I'm not sure where you're, I don't know where you're from. I'm from Virginia. You're from Virginia. Yeah. Well, I'm from New York, and okay. this, this, this art of kind of like finding time within kind of like the multitude in the middle of the metropole, it sounds very 19th century, but yeah. uh, the 19th century got some things right, and I think yeah. that's kind of one of them, kind of finding a, a room of your own or kind mm-hmm. of some headspace while things are going crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it took Proust 4,000 pages to come to that realization in his novel, but... In his court blind Yeah, Yeah, well, that, but that was the ultimate realization. Was, was he also the ultimate prota- uh, procrastinator? Was yes. Was like a, he a was fierce... Famous. Yes, which makes me love him, except that what people didn't realize about him was that he, for all the years that people thought he was a dilettante and just going to parties, he was going home and processing it all. Mm. And That's what I say always when I go to parties. Yeah. yeah. I'm really processing to become post. Yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've tried that. The rare post party writer. Right, the rare post party writer. Bob Silvers was like that too. He was, and he a great Proustian also. But yeah, and you know, so Proust had some things right in the sense that he understood he needed to go home. He talked about it being the black honey of his art, and he would go out yeah. and get pollen and bring it home and, and transmute it, but it took him a long time to do that. And the 4,000-page narrative arc of the novel is the meaning that one can find and the way that one can redeem one's wasted time is to make art. This but, is the black honey of his art. The black honey of his art. It's nice. Rilke, who's my author, says, uh, we are the bees of the invisible. We gather yeah. all the invisible into the hive of our creation. Yeah. So all the other things that are intangible, mm-hmm. we give them shape. I'm, well, we have I a like bee this. of the invisible today. I'm so and happy I have about bees. that. Someone would say I have a lot of bees in my poems. <laughs> do you really? I, I think I do. I didn't realize it until after. It was Alice Quinn. She was like, there are a lot of bees in your poems. And I was like, oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. Um, but I thought I got that from the Georgics. Um, Rilke, <laughs> I was going to say, Rilke yeah. also is a big procrastinator, but in a different, he procrastinated in a different way. It's maybe not safe for, yeah. not safe for a yeah, mixed audience. But he had the sense of solitude as an important part of the, pro- the process. Mm. Well, his, his, his art of procrastination involved solitude. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what other people do. What is your current state of mind? Um, open. My current state of mind is open. Mm. Open for business. <laughs> open for business. Um, what do you consider the most overrated virtue? 
And we think this means, you know, virtue that's viewed as such by society as a whole or yeah. so not necessarily. We had one man who asked if we were talking about the Christian virtues, which was not necessarily the case, although we're open for business for that. <laughs> <laughs> Trust. Trust. Oh. I think that trust as a category is kind of an empty signifier. I, hmm. I find that trust is something that makes sense of itself in the doing, but saying trust as a category, oh, I trust this person doesn't mean anything to me at all. It's hmm. it's about context in which you trust someone. So I don't I don't I don't think about trust as kind of like a category. It doesn't mm-hmm. I need much more specificity than that. Yeah. And I think with all people, there shouldn't be a blanket category, or at least maybe the rarest person where you just use trust full stop. Yeah. Um, I think it's healthy to have um, doubting, whether it was the doubting Thomas, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or Job himself. Yeah. Um, but but, but um, trust for me, that does not mean that, that the idea of trust is not important, but I, I think that we valorize it when it's kind of a caloric type of mm. quality in and of itself. Yeah. So, for instance, I trust Uli, but we'd have to get into a range of specifics just with right. Uli in terms of like what we trust each other about. Yeah, about it's not a state; it's a practice. Yes, yeah. or becoming instant. Right, and hence, and it's, and it's staked on its its disappearance. Right. When you say you trust yes. somebody, that means you know there could be the absence of trust. Absolutely, mm-hmm. and I think that's maybe why when we feel that that is um, absent, our language actually becomes very feral and reduces in pinwheels. We just repeat ourselves, right? So I'll mm-hmm. say, like, how could you do this to me? Right. How, could you do, how could you do this to me? Right. But we don't tend to dissertate. You know, mm-hmm. we, don't, we don't have Roman eloquence when, we, when our sense of trust right. is violated. We, yeah. we kind of become real um, um, language animals. And I mean, it's kind of a really kind of feral and reduced thing. But yeah, no, so. Yeah. On what occasion do you lie? On what occasion do I lie? Um, I don't think I do very much. I'm a notorious great shooter. I will pull back on certain qualitative assessments when I feel like there's no flesh in the game. I'm just going to hurt someone's feelings. Mm -hmm. I'm not really interested in hurting someone's feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, And that would be, I think, as close to a a, a, um, systematic way in Mm -hmm. which I will... um, hold back on the truth a little bit, but I very, very, very much treasure the truth and being truthful. Mm. Or at least people thinking or knowing that um, when they're with me, they're going to have a truthful experience. Mm-hmm. But I don't kind of fetishize that in terms of a truthful experience means I'm going to say a lot of nasty <laughs> crap, right? There are other right. ways to be well, truthful. But right. The next question is, first, <laughs> is the truth? It's a strange question. What do you most dislike about your appearance? Uh, I wish my teeth were whiter. Oh. Well, you can get that done. That's New yeah. York City. Well, I can. Get Every other that. corner they have for that. <laughs> I cannot like things about myself and live with them. Okay, that's also true. Too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Again, late capitalism is telling you to go out and buy a tooth yeah. whitening device. And... I'm kind of as I, I I am as I came out of the box. Still, <laughs> I even have all my wisdom teeth, though. I need to take them out. Oh wow. Oh wow. All right. Which living person do you most despise, if any? I don't think there's a living person I most despise for two reasons. One, I don't believe in hierarchies. So I'd be kind of like parsing in a, in a, in a fake way. I can't think of one person I despise more than others. Mm. I could think of ways to kind of performatively answer that question, um, but it would be performative. Mm. Um, and the other way is I think that we're all victims. Meaning performative, it wouldn't be what you really... Yeah, I can play to the... Just, you're just sort of yeah. satisfying something. Like I'm a writer and you, you, know, you see people sometimes, you're at a gig and people are like, oh, who are your favorite writer? And then they roll out, like, of course, right. all of the luxurious examples they're supposed Every to be. Every Sunday right. morning, who's on your book stand? Right. Somehow those people oh, yeah, are book stands. Always... Right, they're always immaculate, there's right. no... You know what I mean? Yeah. And if you know the person's work, <laughs> yeah. you can also kind of like sniff out what real influences are. And so right. sometimes you're sitting there going, mm, not really. But I, I, I think that, <laughs> you know, I think that we're all, you know, you look at the... You look at the um, you look at the world, and I, and I see a, a bunch of uh, victims. The way that we've kind of just given up on the idea of facts and truth, or the the beneficial nature of the humanities and a, a righteous education and doing the right thing, and the, the absence of that in people can be malevolent. But just the fact that we've gotten to this point, just I just see like victims and people in need of real help, and they're beyond help, but. Um, you know, instead of them earning my um, 
my spite, I just kind of like I pity them. I find myself um, frustrated. Mm. But I'm, I'm, I'm not one to, I don't even use the word hate. I don't tend to say I hate this or that. Yeah. I just kind of recover ways to be positive and optimistic. I'm a, I'm a strange uh, New Yorker and then I'm a devout optimist. Mm. Um, uh, but I still, I, you know, I just like a lot of shit. But there's not there's not there's not one person I despise uh, more than others. I just I, I think we really need some help. I wish people were more um, scared of history. You know, Thank you. people yes. don't seem to at all be people who are in a position to make substantive change in the world don't seem to fear the swinging sword of history. Um, and I'm perplexed by that, and that terrifies me. Yeah, actually. Honestly, but I think those people need um, help. It doesn't matter if I hate them or not. So I don't. Right, mm-hmm. right. And terror and pity you know, that terrifies you, and you feel badly for them. Feel like mm-hmm. they need help, but that's that's a different category of feelings, obviously, than yeah. despising. Yeah, I want to find a better emotion, something that activates something I can do something with. Yeah. What is the quality you most like in a man? Eye contact. What is the quality you most like in a woman? Eye contact. All right. Okay, and just for the listener, we're all making eye contact right now. <laughs> like, no, we're like making an extra effort. Stop looking at my teeth. I was looking at my, teeth, looking looking at my, at my hand. hand. <laughs> um, eye contact, and then take it from there. All right. Yeah. I feel, I, because I feel like things um, change. Okay, what about people for whom that's really hard? Are there probably ways of telling why it's hard for somebody? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, but also, I mean... Empathy, curiosity, you know. I relate to that. Um, but those, I think, are also um, part of eye contact. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Strangely enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I love moments where kind of you're having a conversation and there's not eye contact, and and you both work towards it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> enchanted. <right>. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess a lot of my answers I'm realizing are really about um, um, what's the word in English? They're about kind of like jump starting something yeah. else, something grander, kind of getting on mm-hmm. the road towards something better. Yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like also, based on what you said about clarity at the beginning of the interview, that you're looking for a kind of authenticity, or honesty, you know, like self-knowledge, knowing the other person, empathy, curiosity, contact, and that, um, that again, is such a, a rare nexus of values I think in this yeah. day and age I would say with the rest of it yes I don't believe in authenticity though the first yeah. thing I, I don't believe in authenticity as a as a quality or a thing yeah. I think it's a form of bad faith the rest right. yes yeah I totally yeah, yeah. It, but, but authentic yeah. in the sense that it's like trust it's a kind of a meaningless well but also memory. it's 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 seeking it's seeking a kind of like preformed sense of something that exists that you shouldn't know exists oh, right so you'll yeah. hear somebody say like man I like ate at a Mexican restaurant. It was really authentic. I loved it. What did you oh, have? Yeah, I had no, a burrito. No, 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 like, yeah. well, no, it's not <laughs> no. a burrito. It's American, right? But no. by that, I just mean it's not. Well, you are wrong, not right. But it's rather so that in in, right. in our mind, there's a sense of something that's authentic, right? And mm-hmm. that takes us away from kind of like um, the experience of finding something that we don't know, which is an authentic self. Mm-hmm. Yeah. An authentic yeah, yeah. you would involve me not knowing that you're from Virginia, right? Or that you live in the West Village, right? But rather a whole system of. Yeah. And conversations and experiences that sound like they would be fun because it's yeah. fun talking to you yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah I don't know what authenticity is I don't think we should know what it is yeah no that's you know? that's fair and it's yeah I, I, the Mexican restaurant example is hilarious also it's just it's great to have a poet on to yeah. remind us yeah. to, to attend to you can imagine it's authentically German right you get taken oh, no. into like uh, a, right, exactly right. Yeah, right. yeah no I know right. it's, yeah. A yeah. Stereotype. it's a stereotype of itself right yeah. and it, it's, it centralizes something that is a form of living right and it's from the outside it's from without not from within yeah 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 um which words or phrases do you most overuse if any first of all is a phrase i use i oh. think way too much right. i think that's my mind or organizing a system of ideas um first of all uh what other words do i use quite a bit process Hmm. I use quite a bit um, but you know I'm uh, 
I've always got kind of three languages in my head going at once, so there are ways in which I'm kind of like this macaronic loss of of hierarchy in my head. Sometimes yeah. I forget words in the in other languages, yeah, sure. or even in English. Um, but I think that's basically it. Like, first of all, I used to say like a lot as a kid, but then my dad would go, like, every time I said like. <laughs> wow. So that, that's a good way to get that. That's a good way to get that out of your system. What's the other two languages besides English at this moment? Uh, well, Catalan and Spanish. Okay. okay. What or who is the greatest love of your life? Oh, my wife, no question. And when and where were you happiest? I hopefully don't know the answer to that question yet. Okay. Uh, which talent would you most like to have? And we presume it means a talent you don't currently have, but right. maybe it's yeah. one you already have. <laughs> so which talent would you most like to have? I would like to be able to learn so many languages flawlessly, quickly, and efficiently. I wish I could do that. Uh, and I fear this thing about age that people say that you kind of lose it. I presume it's true, I but think I guess it's past the age of 11. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. Well, I still got time then. Mm -hmm. I actually, um, I actually Peter, thought that's what they say. No, right? my mother uh, did some classes. She uh, got her PhD in psychology, and she was really interested in language acquisition in the brain. Mm -hmm. And that, at least, that's what I learned from her back that's in the day. Was 11 you, yeah. is, well, 11 is the cutoff for total fluency and a perfect accent. And then I think it's sort of diminishing returns. Right. right. Until at some point at which your brain completely calcifies, and, and with any luck, none time. of us have reached that point yet. But yeah, no. I mean, but I, then there's an asymptotic relationship, so I'm probably an 80% English, but then my German is probably by now going to a 60%. So ultimately, you level out. You all level out, yeah, no matter when you learn your languages. Language. They're yeah. all going to be just a kind of murky, <laughs> mediocre. Well, yeah. Well, I'm just kind of like seeing, um, you know, I have an eight-year-old daughter and a five-year-old daughter who I could add mm -hmm. to the loves of my life um, mm -hmm. question, but just kind of seeing. Seeing them go through it, the 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 minds just it's incredible and mysterious, yeah. and yeah. you feel at at my age like you've missed all of a sudden all that time you didn't have in the past. You're like, oh, I should have studied Japanese, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> Whereas back then, of course, you yeah. were studying what we call studying. You were absorbing yeah. so yeah. much more information than the 25 words a day or whatever right. you learned, or even in two or three languages. Right. But that's what you weren't studying because you were a child. Exactly. Taking in the world, which yeah. is, <laughs> you yeah. know, not exactly. being an instruction manual. Or, or even, I learned something about, um, the first time I went to Germany, I think I was 20, jeez, and I went to Frankfurt, and I was just kind of watching TV, and it was the first time I realized that I had been surrounded by a German environment, and it was like, I was like, wow, this is a lovely language, because I realized I had spent up until then being exposed to German through... Um, Uh, televised and cinematic personas. Oh, so yeah. they were always <laughs> yeah. angry oh, and aggressive, Nuremberg right? Rallies. And, yeah. so the, and so the language was always, you know what I mean? And so, so you start to hear <laughs> kind of like, cringy. well, cringe, really cringe. No, yeah. But just being in these yeah. types of contexts where you get the full spectrum of moods and everything like that, and I just realized, they, are, of they are leaders and poetry and, po and <laughs> Childhood and, and love. <laughs> It's well, such a thing. <laughs> well, sure, but the but the experience orders yourself to think that right. because you you become just a recipient. You yeah. you're a consumer for so many years sure. with the language is coming at you in a certain yeah. way, right? Yeah. Um, I think the same is with Spanish for, for a lot of people to understand. It just sounds very fast, right? I see. Often. Yeah, that's true. Um, Or people say, "Oh, French is so beautiful and poetic," and it's like. It's a nice sounding language, but yeah. there are a lot of shades, shades and registers shades. to it that are beyond just some sort of abstract yeah. and cliched category. Oh yeah, for poetry. outsiders, a bureaucratic text in French is very romantic. Right. Not exactly. for people who are reading Not exactly. Right well, and, and uh, I mean, let's face it, Champois. S H A M P O O I N G is not the most lovely element. No, no, I don't. Yeah, the there, English right? words are, I've been really often so ugly in French. Clown or clown is so bad. Um, if you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? I would care about money more. Hmm. But you keep everything else. Without, yeah. yes, without yeah. sacrificing. Without sacrificing being yourself. a poet versus yeah. an investment banker. Or, right, yeah. right. But I would, yeah, I, w I, would, I, would, I would prioritize, um, yeah, I would pro prioritize some of those aspects of my life a bit more. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you're embarking on a new part of your career. Hey, who knows? 
Yeah, yeah, but for me, I take it as a screenwriter, right? So that sort of, in most people's world, that's more closely related to that goal than being a poet. Uh, well, anything's more closely related to that goal than being a, 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 <laughs> poet. a poet. Well, no, no, I'm also, I'm not complaining. I just, I just, I, I realize that on the, yeah. you know, on the grand spectrum of things, I'm, you know, I'm somebody with a, a family now, but I'm still kind of first and foremost a poet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just, I find myself thinking about that, you know, and just kind of like, um, you know, financial education and all those types mm-hmm. of things that I, I, I'm realizing now at my age, I find are important. And I, um, I railed against them, I think, on principle as mm-hmm. being signs of kind of like not having your soul on, right? Sure. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so... I think now my goal is to still be as I am, but also kind of like think about those things and have those talks with, you know, my children and all these types of things. Now that I see my children and you see just how how unfair the world is and how people make terrible, terrible uh, economic decisions that end up having existential consequences because yeah. they, they're not educated. We're completely de-educating right. our populace, yeah. whether it's the Bible. Yeah. You know, I'd like to teach my kids about religions without yeah. being religious necessarily about it. And the yeah. same way I'd like to teach them about, and even myself, about financial matters without being, you know, running a hedge fund or something. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it seems like there should be a way to do that, mm-hmm. right? You didn't see that one coming, right? Yeah. You didn't no, see that answer coming. No, right? I didn't. But in fact, I, my husband is an economist, and yet paradoxically, or maybe not paradoxically, he has the he has less awareness of actual money and how actual right. money operates than anyone else. I oh, know. Sure. It's like mathematicians. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, it's all so abstract that yeah. you know. So we'll be in a cab and he'll be like, "What was oh, his previous job? Oh, yeah. You want to put that on record? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but he'll be like, "Oh, yeah. Um, do we need? Uh, I guess do we have to pay the cabbie now? You know, like <laughs> no awareness. And so we were just talking about this last night, and he was saying, "Yeah, I kind of." I kind of wish that I had that mm. mindset too. So no, I didn't see it yeah. coming from you, but it was interesting to hear um, because we were just having that conversation in a sort of a contiguous context. Yeah, I don't mean like, oh, poor me, my pockets are empty, or like I don't count my change when I get it, but just like, yeah, just those you know, those types of conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do think it's a mentality that, you know, that some people are. So yeah, I was briefly after college and before I finished uh, my PhD uh, in grad school with Uli, I was an investment banker, and I was a really bad investment banker. It turns out that I'm numerically dyslexic, so I would reverse numbers all the time, and that would have terrible... Talk about existential consequences. Yeah, yeah, but, sure, sure. Um, but also, I remember one of the... I worked at Goldman Sachs, and one of the partners came to my desk one night and said, you know, the thing about this job is if you want to do it well, you have to really want to be rich. And... It was so wild to hear that stated so baldly because that well, I thought, oh well, it's a good experience and I'll learn about the markets and I'll be able to pay my own rent. But I learned that I was surrounded by people for whom this idea of I want to be rich, I want to be rich, was animating everything they were doing. It's a very difficult job, and the people who do it work incredibly hard. But it's a mindset, and so I think in a related way, thinking and kind of caring more about money, it's a mindset. Right. So it's not. Materialism, it's not the desire to have a hedge fund, but mm-hmm. it is a mindset that maybe is one that, especially in our current jobs, all three of our current jobs, we don't. The, the great thing is that answer you want, or that motivation you want to be rich, is so partial. For what purpose? Yeah. I, I get, I get it, but it well, would be really good to remember what you want to be rich, what what to be what rich for. You want to be rich yeah. for something. Yeah. It's almost like saying, you know, you want to be healthy, I'm knocking on wood, of course. For what? For its own sake. Mm-hmm. You want to do things. Like, if you have lots of money, you want to do things. You don't no, just like want to spend on that money. That's actually yeah. the, the, that's right. the question that doesn't... And if that's the goal in itself, that's an end in itself. That seems... Like, sitting here with all my money now. Yeah. <laughs> Being unhappy. Yeah. Also, you know, you, know what, Paul, you know what my ears perked up to and what you were saying about um, your previous... Um, vocation you said i was sitting at my desk one night yeah 
Oh yeah, I caught that yeah. part too. Yeah. Again, <laughs> right. the poet, with yeah. the, and that you're right. That's the kicker because yeah, it was, it was always at night sitting yeah. in my attic yeah. with my one candle, <laughs> yes. writing, looking no. over the rooftops. Yeah, and that that was a normal. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I remember. I what actually I failed upwards. I got hired away from Goldman to J.P. Morgan with more uh, money and more responsibility, which was also not a good idea. But my one negotiating point was I want to be able to leave before three a.m. Because at Goldman, that was like the minimum. And it's I look back and I think how crazy that I had reached a point a year into my three-year, ultimately, career on Wall Street. And all I wanted was, and that was, I think, for its own sake, or just to get some sleep or do some laundry. But yeah, sitting at your desk one night, which I guess we all do now. Do you work at night? Do you write at night? Not, any, not anymore. I've gotten to a point where it's like I'm an, I get up very early in the morning. Yeah. At night, I'm, I'm done. And that's family time or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. After we put the girls to bed, quality time with the yeah. misses and yeah. some books and you know catching up on some movies and that everything like that. I can't work at night because then I can't sleep. Well, that if too. I work I after eight o'clock. I've been doing it last week. I was doing something and then I just mm-hmm. cannot sleep. I used to. I don't mind it actually. I'm awake all night and then I'm thinking about what I'm writing and yeah. then I want to get up again. But then it's four in the morning and I want to get up. I yeah, the endocrine really system. Used. Like, yeah, my, I would be just kind of too wired, I think, to get a good yeah. night's sleep. Yeah. So I, I really kind of shut it down, and also try to be a good kind of like partner. You know what I yeah. mean? Right. Um, I think about that a lot. Kind of how to make the the space not kind of like this is the we live here, but this is the realm where I work. You know, um, and trying to work that out. Um, but you know what you said about three a.m. and kind of like getting off by then. I think it also ties into what I said about time right like I couldn't be I couldn't value the things that I value and have the type of life that you're yeah you're describing I think that's right I think that and that's why people who don't like that profession who've tried it or maybe people who haven't even tried it but have some awareness about it just you know it's soul killing and Mm -hmm. that's the soul killing part of it it's not that it's bad to be focused on money or do these Mm -hmm. deals or maybe in some cases it is bad but uh, when you're firing thousands of people but um, just this idea that there's no room left for you. There's no time. Right. There's no time. Your time always belongs to someone else, and you get paid very well for that. But remember that Pink Floyd song, "Welcome to the Machine." Yes, yes. Yeah. Welcome, my son. Um, <laughs> what do you consider your greatest achievement besides that Pink Floyd reference? <laughs> Which went right over my head. <laughs> sure. Um. Well. I mean, I think I have to. I think I have to go with a holy trinity. My greatest achievements are one um, that I found the absolute ideal person to spend the rest of my life with, um, which I take no credit for, but it happens. So I'll count it as an achievement. Yeah. Um, and I'm much better in all facets of my life because of that union than I otherwise would be. Having my children because they're wonderful kids, and I have, you know, my wife and I. With kids, we waited like over eight years to have kids. We've been together for 17 years or so. Um, and when we decided to have kids, we just had one plan, which we still have, and it's that the world is overcrowded. Resources are uh, scarce and even worse, um, um, not divided equitably. Um, and there are a lot of assholes in the world. And all we wanted to do is if we're going to add to the world count is not add two assholes to the world <laughs> and they're not two assholes thus far yeah, I'm thus really far. proud of that <laughs> thus far thus far <laughs> um, and, and, the, and, the, and the third one is that I've left a paper trail you know um, this is a country where not only were people of African descent um, uh, permitted from, from writing but any whites who were found to help them would also be in serious serious legal trouble and probably the threat of great bodily harm mm. um, you know the fact that at this point I can leave a paper trail with my name on it kind of um, who I've been what I thought um, it's not an achievement I take for granted but at the same time I don't want to leave crap on the bookshelves <laughs> but um, I don't take any of that for granted because this country wasn't it was not created for things like that to happen yeah. um and there's a way in which the future of this country didn't anticipate me or you yeah. or you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I keep that in mind. And I, and I kind of like write to the fact of that and write to the future and let the future make sense of it, you know? So. 
Rowan, if you were to die and come back as a person or a thing, what would it be? Me. You. Yes. Thanks. Right. Where would you most like to live if you're not already living where you would most like to live? Uh, I'd most like to live in New York, um, but if I couldn't live in New York, um, then Paris. All right. Yeah. Have you spent quite a bit of time there? Or? Depends on what quite. I mean, I've been there a bunch of yeah. times, but yeah. you know, quite a bit becomes a. Different right. What does that even mean? Yeah, yeah. But, I think you, know, you I mean, spend a lot of time in Paris. Yeah, I've lived there. I mean, there. I know, yeah. like, there, right? yeah. like I really like the eleventh. You know. Yeah, it's cool over there. Yeah, it's cool over there. You're close enough to the fourth and all that stuff to kind of be there. I've always been like, I don't need to be there, but I need to, yeah. you know, I like to be in real neighborhoods. We can kind of get around, um, you know, the West over by the 15th and all that's too, like, but I like, you know, um, Paris seems, speaking of not anticipating yourself, Paris is problematic, like New York and everywhere is problematic, but I feel like Paris is a place where um, it's not a shock to see me walking down the street yeah. or having an idea or writing a book yeah. or kind of being arm in arm with my my wife from Barcelona who looks she's like she's from Copenhagen or yeah, whatever yeah, you just yeah. kind of go about your business and I've been a lot of places where you kind of walk by or open your mouth and people are like you know yeah. what the fuck yeah. um, and it gets tiring kind of um, having your existence be an amazing thing mm. <laughs> and I feel like in Paris no one really gives a fuck I think that's right which I <laughs> yeah see, right. I really do think they that's do right. but yeah. they don't share it well, but, well, I'll take that. well or they, give a, they give a fuck about different things than what you're describing. They give a fuck that you said hello the wrong way to the waiter when you walked into the restaurant. Yes, and they give a fuck that you, you know, ate your ice cream with a spoon rather than a fork. Right. right. But, and whereas, conversely, and I don't give a fuck about them giving a fuck about stuff like that. Right. So, so I'm kind of like, yeah. And it's not having your existence be, you know, questioned or deemed, as you say, amazing, which right. I imagine would get exhausting and it's just bizarre. You know. yeah. I like this attitude. You said this in the other interview we had about <coughs> your work and sort of literature, that no one anticipated us. Mm. And in some ways to live with that awareness is also important and that means don't expect people to actually accept you because they couldn't. Yeah. It's almost not on them then. That's right. They couldn't anticipate you. So right. it's not on right. them. You were unanticipated as a person, as a being and that's once you accepted that, then it's not, oh, they're getting it wrong, they should have seen me coming. They never, they... Agreed. You know what I mean? So it's kind of self-invention in that, and you're writing to say, I'm here, this is who I am. You have to learn that. Mm. It sort of gives you a space out of others saying they're, they're bad, they're prejudiced, they have all these assumptions. They do, they have. But it's almost not on them. Right. Whereas, yeah, I, I think that's spot on. And, and just also, you know, I, you know, I'm a kid of Caribbean... Um, well, I mean, you know, my, I'm from the Caribbean, basically, and I just mm -hmm. feel like I can... There's a version of me in Paris, right? Yeah. You know, my family's from Antigua, that's spitting distance yeah. from Guadeloupe. Yeah. There's a Guadeloupe version of me in yeah. in in Paris. That kind yeah. of makes sense. So I don't... Whereas, for instance, even, in, you know, in Germany, I would imagine that there would be a lot of assumption that, like, I'm a kid of, like, a U.S. arm, you know, kind of like a company right. U.S. service and everything like that. Right. And for me, who's... I mean, I am only American because I was born here because my folks were poor. They were comfortable and yeah. poor and came to yeah. New York huh. in the 70s. Yeah. Um, uh, which I guess if you're bored, <laughs> who else do you want to be? Yeah. But so that connection, even that connection to like the US military or kind of like this kind of like American thing would seem very weird to me even mm. in Germany because there'd be kind of like a way to make sense supposedly yeah. of me. That has nothing to do with you. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I think Paris, it's close enough to, to Barcelona also to be there all the time without being there all the time. Yeah. Got a lot yeah, of family yeah. there and the stuff like that. So. What is your most treasured possession? My temperament. Mm -hmm. oh. Did you mean a material possession? No, what do you no. describe it as? Your temperament. Can you describe yeah. it in a sentence or something? Or what do you treasure about it? Um, I think that my, tr my temperament is the most... I'm not sure if I go for like ego and id kind of... Uh, stuff but my temperament is kind of like the bellwether of my intuitive organs it's 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 the it's the map of kind of like my emotions and my sensibilities um i trust it. it doesn't lie to me i've spent my life kind of like working on it it's kind of my uh it's my partner in crime i have kind of the conversations i need to have conversations with it's um it's not my psychology um it's just 
I don't know how I can put it other than to say it's 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 like the skyscape. You know when you look at a you know you look at a painting or you look at a photo or you just kind of like look out at the city. You take a lot of on Instagram, really. You post a lot of wonderful. It's just kind of like the the immenseness of a view. There's a part of me mm-hmm. that kind of like takes in the whole picture, mm-hmm. um, but it's not. Um, it's something I have and that I can access. I think it's why I kind of like write poems and stuff like that. It has a mind of its own. Mm. Um, I don't know where I got it from. I think I got it from my mom, but mm. I like it. Yeah. What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Oh, indifference. Mm. Indifference. Mm. In all aspects, whether it's a political aspect, uh, a, a socioeconomic aspect, a social aspect, um, but even also um, love. You know, people get things wrong, I think, when they think that the worst thing that can happen is that somebody who you loved all of a sudden says they hate you. Back to that word hate. No, 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 no. I mean, the sharpest sword is indifference. Yeah. That mm-hmm. someone who you shared a life with is suddenly completely indifferent to you. Yeah. That you could be sitting with them pleading yeah. for them to get you back, and they're just kind of like, they're just over it. And beyond over it, yeah. they're just over the conversation, over your yeah. presence. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. I just think that indifference, mm-hmm. um, whether it's in love and the suffering of others, it's, uh, it's a shame that we've been... Well, actually, I was going to say it's a shame we've kind of had that installed in us, but in some ways it's also useful, I think, for some things, right? Like when we are on the side of being indifferent to that person who's... who's it's yeah. survival in some Freedom. cases. Yes. Yeah. It's yes. also that because there's also not just love but all other sorts of relations. So sure. It can become a mode of survival. Sure. And also even, I think, you know, I have moments where I have to be indifferent to the racial state of things in my writing. Because if you're not, I hope that doesn't sound strange, but if you're not then everything becomes tautological to your oppression and suffering, which means that everything then is about um, the gaze and power and imposition of others. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there's something that Toni Morrison had brilliantly right, that part of what um, racism is and part of what racial oppression is is this endless distraction from doing mm-hmm. the great things that right. we're all capable of as individuals. Yeah. And so sometimes, because sometimes the race nonsense is really just trifling, what she says, it's a distraction, a deliberate distraction oh, for decades to not do your work. Absolutely. And so, yeah. you know, I get tired of it. I yeah. become indifferent to it. Yeah. I once, I remember some interview a million years ago um, that Toni Morrison did with Charlie Rose. Oh, yeah. Of all people. 1998. Right? Yeah. And she just took him down. And oh, he was yeah. like, well, so tell me about being a black woman writer. And she's like, I can tell you about being a writer. And yeah. she said, it's not my you problem, asshole. it's yours. I remember once <laughs> I, I, I love that you have a year. <laughs> no. Yeah. Memory. Um, it's a job requirement, right? The memory. He asked Colson Whitehead once. Oh. He said, so you went to Harvard. Tell me, how did that happen? And he, and he went, yeah, I applied. Nice. So you could have asked yeah. Charlie Rose, you are interviewing me, how did that happen? Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's what... um, okay. What would be your favorite occupation? What, you know, the real question is, what is your favorite occupation? But assuming mm. that you aren't already doing your favorite occupation, what else would you... Oh, I mean, I'm, I am doing my favorite occupation. Yeah, yeah. If I had to do something else, um, can I say painting? Mm-hmm. Of course. Because I think, I, I mean... I think I was meant to be a painter or musician, actually, huh. but I didn't know how, how one becomes a painter. You know what I mean? I, I just, it's not something that I, I invested any time in kind of thinking about, but I still understand the world, I think, mm-hmm. first and foremost, through this um, kind of constant ekphrasis, this mm-hmm. kind of like turning images into words. Um, and then also just a uh, musician. I, just, I grew up with music. My dad was a uh, bassist in bands and stuff like that. And always had music and playing instruments around and everything like that. Um, but those are two things where I never... I understand them as vocations now in my kind of adulthood. But I never, I think, as a kid understood um, the grind behind them. And I don't know that I would have liked that. I mean, painters are, are by and large insane. Yeah. Um, and, you know, musicians, I don't know that I would, I don't know how many kind of like trips to Hoboken to kind of like play at 1130 at night and end up with like 15 bucks for the gig. I'm not sure if, there's love of music, which I do, but I'm not sure that I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You know. 
Um, what is your most marked characteristic? And we think that means what trait of yours do you think people notice first and foremost about you? Mm. Um, I think my intelligence, for better or for worse, you know? Um, you know, I grew up in the 80s and such. I had my fair share of, you're so articulate, you're so well-spoken, you're so smart, you know what I mean? Um, and I, and I, I do look back now and think that a, a good portion of uh, my formative years were kind of like spent under this kind of like aegis of being the smart one, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, and the way that kind of like tracks you or even marks you, but I was, I was also a good athlete, so I was never kind of like, you know, isolated out. But that's right. because I also understood kind of unconsciously the, the language of kind of like the, you know, this masculine language that kind of like keeps you safe. So I could write poems because I was writing lyrics for the bands I was in, and, you know. I could play sports well and everything like that. And I think those were ways to negotiate my, um, my kind of like developing life in art and as an artist, because I never, like, I was never, I never wrote for the student paper, or I never was any in art clubs, I never wore a beret or anything. <laughs> like that. I was always just kind of like a guy hanging out, but then when I was home or on my own, or I went to school not too far away from the Met, I would always kind of be dipping in there, but I was definitely, I've always been um, very kind of um, individualistic and idiosyncratic in my um, pursuits of art and mm-hmm. such like that. Yeah. What do you most value in your friends? I most value in my friends that they value themselves because I hate repeating myself and I find myself having, I have a lot of patience I think for a lot of different stuff, but I don't have much patience for people who pinwheel on the same types of um, failings or, or failures. I understand that that happens and perhaps this is my least sympathetic side mm-hmm. I'm talking about, um, but I, I, I I like to be around people that ask themselves the hard questions about themselves. They don't have to do it in my presence, but you can kind of just tell when people have spent time with themselves. And I think you can tell when people have not spent time with themselves. And I find that when you're around people who don't spend time with themselves and they keep kind of like tripping over the same rocks again and again and again, you end up in the same kind of like position with them and trying to support them in the same ways. And that's kind of like a form of um, death in life. So. I just like people being able to kind of like face up to themselves. Um, it's hard to explain, but I think you can tell when kind of people have woken up in the mirror and kind of had a good look in the mirror and mm-hmm. take it. You take it from there. I also don't need a lot of friends, honestly. Um, but that's because um, when you got good ones, mm. it's not it's not quantity. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Who are your favorite writers? And I know you just talked about yeah, people I really answering don't. that question and sort of yeah, like I, I really do. I honestly do not them. have favorite writers. I love. I mean, I feel like writers you absolutely love have to let you down at some point, mm-hmm. uh, and writers who you don't think anything of have to surprise you mm-hmm. at some yeah. point. Even yeah. with a, it could be a paragraph, it could be a stanza. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I live for those moments as well. Mm-hmm. They give me hope. First of all, that kind of like. People you, 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 you hold to the highest level of estimation can fail, but also yeah. people who you don't really have on your radar can rise up and have these great moments. Yeah. Reminds me of that great moment in, um, in Yeats' Vacillation when he writes, um, and for 20 minutes more or less it was so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. You know? But yeah, so I don't, I don't need to have favorites. It doesn't seem like it does anything... Um, for me, I just try to read everything. Um, I leave myself open to wonder and surprise and, and disappointment. I mean, I can tell you about novels I absolutely loved at 20 that I don't at all love now, and I can tell you why, and I think that's really an important part of the process, right. and vice versa. We talk about that all the time, the yeah. books that used to be so important that now just honor the books that surprise you later. Yeah, yeah. So for me, the most important thing with art is to have a non-hierarchical mind. Um, and that doesn't mean that there's not a canon. That does not mean that there's not a sense of um, some work um, doing what they need to do better than others. Um, but I just, I, 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 don't, I don't do favorites. So, Who's your hero, if you have one in fiction, and we assume it would include film also? Okay. An, an invented person. Oh, whoa. <laughs> 
Um. Oh. Whoa. That's a good one. I don't know. I'm going to say, though. I'm going to say Superman. At his best, I'm going to say Superman. He's an immigrant. He's a refugee. Right? He, 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 uh... He's not an ant play. <laughs> he's both smart and plays sports, sort of. Yeah. 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 Well, but also, right. you know what? He's someone, he's someone who, in terms of the occupation that he chose in being a reporter, chose something where um, super strength, super speed, none of that does the... helps him. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to write. Yeah. You have to... Really, be able to report mm-hmm. and write. Um, I think that that's admirable, um, and I think that the idea, at its best, and even when we look at the you know the Superman from the nineteen thirties, um, he was a lefty. He was around a kind of like you know he he dressed up in loud co- loud tight colors, <laughs> and his hair was fabulous, yeah. and he was there to kind of like stand up for the people. His 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 arch enemy is a uh, arch industrialist straight out of central casting for an Ayn Rand, mm-hmm. you know, novel. Yeah. Um, and as perfect as he may seem, his work is is unethical, right? I mean, he's he's violating all types of kind mm-hmm. of like mm-hmm. journalistic, sure. you know, credos yeah. um, by what he does and with his partner. But he's he's, I don't know. I find it in a very interesting although imperfect premise. Yeah. Um, and I think that it translates well to if you think of yourself either as a woman or as a German or as a, a, a black individual, kind of like, what if, yeah. you know? Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. And I love your point about how he could have really picked any job. Like, construction worker would have been super easy for yeah. Superman, but yeah. the idea that he chose the one thing that yeah. his super strengths weren't going to... Yeah. He sure. could have been a he could have been a sculptor and yeah. never had to have an office job and just kind of like make amazing sculptures out of diamonds in yeah. two seconds and, and be ultra rich. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. But there's this kind of desire to be in the metropole among the people and kind of like put in a shift. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and report. Report the truth. Which historical figure do you most identify with, if any? Oh um Oh, wow. Um, does Adam from Genesis count? He's not a historical figure. That does not count. No, <laughs> sure. I no, that doesn't it. count. Yeah. Adam from America count. believes he wasn't right. historical. Well, I'm not, in that, I'm not in that half. So, yeah. so you can put um, him in the fictional heroes. Okay, we can yeah. move between those two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, he's definitely not a hero. Um, well, you know what? None, I realize. And, and, and I realize it's none because... Uh, when you're black and you think about your relationship to history, it's 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 hard, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and there's there's a, a large part of kind of what history would mean, and I don't mean my personal history because I don't know what my personal history is. But in terms of kind of like um, how I'm supposed to relate to history, I don't have all of it. I mm-hmm. just have kind of the history that has been given to me as such. Um, but you know, motifs of time travel and thinking about the past are incredibly fraught and problematic. I certainly love history, and mm-hmm. you know, I've been, I've, <laughs> I read as much historical fiction and poetry as I can. Um, but the the history that we have, it wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I don't find myself. Um, I'd have to change the. I would have to change the notion of the game, before I could. Mm-hmm. answer that in a way that makes me feel as though I'm actually giving mm-hmm. an honest answer yeah. because I don't have my history it's part of the tragedy um, and the glory. we don't have our history I would even say mm-hmm. yeah. um, and that's part of the tragedy and the glory of of uh, being us and having moments like we're having in this conversation um, man I I'm really not trying to be coy I just I really do think about the structures well I think about the difference between choices and options right and I think about the structures in which I'm being asked to make either a choice or an option. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, this history as we have it doesn't 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 work for me to just kind of like plug myself into it. 
Right. So. Like, oh, I could go back and be Napoleon. Yeah. yeah no. Who are your yeah. heroes in real life? Oh man, you know my heroes in real life are definitely my my folks, my grandmother. You know, my wife, her folks, who lived through a dictatorship. You know. Um, you know, living's living's hard. Um, and making making good people in light of that, I think, is even harder. It's difficult. I admire people who do it. And that doesn't mean that their resume is right. right. Or they kind of like got into the right schools. I guess that would be part of their resume being right. Um, but it's just like, yeah, the world is filled with assholes. I really honor people who kind of like put in a good shift mm -hmm. and also manage not to bring more assholes into the world. <laughs> and I'm really, really bothered by people bringing more assholes into the world. Yeah. It's unnecessary. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? At a minimum, it's unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's, 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 <laughs> it's unkind. <laughs> it's un <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I mean, definitely my, you know, my mom, my wife, her folks, my grandparents. Well, my grandmother's the only one still alive, but, you know. What are your favorite names? Nuria, my wife's name, and Imogen, and Astrid, my daughter's name. Nice. What is it that you most dislike? Ignorance. Ignorance. It strikes me as unnecessary and willfully unnecessary, right? A lack of, a lack of curiosity about our, our contradictions, right? You know, we will have, you know, if, God forbid this happens, if something happens to Ruth Bader Ginsburg within the next year, we're going to have Mitch McConnell do backflips to, to get another Supreme Court justice in, right? The, 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 the rampant hypocrisy of that act will be obvious to everyone, but most people, they just won't hear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you have people in large swaths of this country, geographical swaths, who are completely against policies which would give them health insurance, and they don't have it now, and they're suffering, and they have no idea. Yeah. Right. This to me is it's ignorance. Right. It's ignorance. What is your greatest regret? I don't believe in regret. Um, you know, my mom raised me to control things I can control and things I can't control, and just kind of, ah, let them go. But if I could do something about something, I do it. If I can't, I pass. Um, or I process it so I can do something better the next time. But regret to me seems like a, a form of kind of like not acting, not being, and, and um, not learning. It's, it's kind of like this, this, this um, placebo for action. It's like doing when, something when you just said it, I thought of sort of the Emily Dickinson, I dwell... Impossibility. Impossibility, because when people, when people use the word dwell, they think I dwell on it as right. if it's looking in the past. And she says, no, I dwell in possibility, which is, turns that word around into something forward-looking. Right on. And creative, rather than dwelling, obsessing. Impossible for doors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, no, I mean, you know, I really value risk. And I think that a lot of what I'm saying involves a lot of kind of risk with yourself. It's very easy to be like, I don't believe it, regret I'm a sociopath. Right? I don't give a fuck about anything, yeah. right? And so there's That's a way in which Aristotle between <laughs> courage and recklessness. Right. Like, and so know. there's this there's this there's this risk with with being that way and and um um I accept that. Um but I don't want it to turn into kind of like an excuse for malevolence. Um mm -hmm. but I but I do also try to be um emotionally and ethically and pra uh, efficient. Not pragmatic, but just kind of efficient. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Regret doesn't seem very efficient to me. Yeah. yeah. How would you like to die? When it's my time. Um, but the rest is not in my hands, so I don't even think about it. I don't know. What is your motto? Choose your battles. Hmm. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Hmm. Efficiency. It's from my mom. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, oh, and then we've added a final question to the original Proust questionnaire, which is who, which person, and ideally it would be a living person, uh, would you like to hear doing this podcast? 
answering these questions? Ooh. Um, well, that's a good one. Um, living. Yeah, living. Uh, Ideally, because maybe we will, maybe we'll ask them. Oh, great. Oh, great, great, yeah. great. In that case, um, Stevie Wonder. Oh, yes. <laughs> he was worth the wait, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, he was. I feel like maybe he wouldn't. He won't do it, will he? He'd be ready, of course. He needs to share. Oh, that would be so great. <laughs> if you do, I tell him I say hi and much respect. Will we do. Now we'll invite you in to yeah, ask some of the questions. Well, thank you so much. This oh, was really, you. really, it was wonderful to talk to you. No, it was a real pleasure. Yeah, pleasure thank you for being on my second podcast. Mm-hmm. Always a pleasure. Anytime. Anytime. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.